Welcome everybody to another installment of Coach's Corner. Uh, this is something that we've had the privilege to partner with IHSAA uh, to allow these meetings to happen and to hopefully provide some very good education uh, to you and to coaches and to administrators to make uh, our sports medicine athletes and our high school kids uh, healthier and more active in what they're doing. Uh, and to provide just education to, to take care of them better. Um, during the webinar, you can certainly ask questions. I ask that you use the chat function at the top of Teams. If you just click on that, uh, feel free to send in any comment or question uh, during the webinar, and I'll uh, typically address those during the time that we're here. Uh, we're trying to keep this relatively short. Uh, I know this is a, a midday meeting and it's hard to find the time, so we'll try to keep it to about 30 minutes total. Uh, and I would ask to please have you fill out any evaluations that are sent to you after the meeting, because this will help shape uh, what information we're providing and, and future topics that work best for you. Uh, so it's my privilege today to introduce Will Fleming, uh, who's a, not only a good friend of mine, but uh, truly a master of understanding strength and conditioning. Uh, he's one of only 20 coaches in the country to hold the credential of uh, USA Weightlifting Air National Coach. Uh, he is the owner and coach at One Kilo. Uh, he is a very sought after coach for the highest level of Olympic lifters. Uh, he's also a reigning master's level Olympic lifting champ uh, and competitions are often taking him around the world. Uh, so I'm still waiting for my first invite to accompany him as maybe a, a doc for his lifting team would be nice. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> anyway, I think he's got some great information to share with us and then we'll we'll have a little bit more conversation when he's done so will over to you thanks scott okay so um we can go into the next slide um i'll tell you guys just a little bit more about me in the next slide um which uh, my background i was an athlete all my life like a lot of people who get into strength and conditioning and um saw an opportunity after completing my collegiate career where I was a track and field athlete and I was an All-American at Indiana University in, in uh, the hammer throw. I opened a place called Force Fitness and Performance in Bloomington and that was a sports performance gym, uh, catered to really everybody, but we did a ton of sports performance, strength and conditioning type, type of stuff. We would contract out with high schools and worked with um, five high schools over the course of the period where we take over the whole um, strength and conditioning program and also just had individual athletes coming in and so over the course of 10 years from 2008 to 2018 i had 125 division one athletes um and uh over 200 plus collegiate athletes so division one two three naia um and, and we had professional athletes in all sports and in bloomington that's relatively harder to do so we had nba players um helped some a couple guys get their first contracts in the nba uh, we had NFL uh, players, Major League Baseball guys. We had a guy set the record for the most steals in uh, minor league baseball history uh, one season, then moved up and played in the majors for seven or eight years after that. So we had some really good successes and Olympians as well, uh, just operating sports performance stuff uh, locally and also worked in the high school uh, setting. Uh, in 2018, I sold that and decided to focus full time on coaching weightlifting as a sport. And so we've had some really good success, have American record holders and national champions and uh, Olympic hopefuls. Hopefully in two years, I'll be coaching at the Olympics um, with uh, a couple of my athletes who are uh, really uh, successful. And then the other thing over there is I've written a couple books. Um, one is velocity-based training for weightlifting where we explore, you know, kind of some deeper metrics on how to uh, approach weightlifting as a sport and weightlifting as it pertains to sport performance a book called Complete Olympic Lifting, where I uh, just teach you how to be uh, better and coach the Olympic lifts, snatches and clean and jerks, and then uh, contributed the chapter on uh, strength and power to the book called Complete Sports Training. So um, I've had a pretty broad uh, level of experience in strength and conditioning in the last 15 or so years. So next slide, if you would. Okay, so uh, you know, if we talk about strength and conditioning, I, I think it's really good to start at the beginning and way back when, when strength and conditioning kind of first came on the scene, because, right, you know, now it's kind of a given, right? If you are a, a high school or, you know, collegiate or whatever, you are 
you're going to have a strength and conditioning program of some sort. But, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of years ago, that was not, not the case. And, and knowing where it started helps us kind of see what's going on now. So it would make athletes too muscle bound. And you guys, we've heard that, you know, I heard that when I started lifting still, uh, you know, 25 or yeah, 25 plus years ago that you might get muscle bound or too bulky. You'd be too stiff. You'd get, you'd get, you're more likely to get injured. You'd be too slow if you lifted weights or only bodybuilders lifted weights. Those are all kind of those early misconceptions. And you can see some of those remnants still today with certain populations that you're going to get too bulky or you're going to get too muscle bound or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas, you know, the truth about strength and conditioning is, is much different. So next slide, if you would, um, that all changed, uh, strength and conditioning history kind of all changed in the late fifties. And the guy on the right, not the guy lifting, but the guy in the background, that's a guy named Alvin Roy. And he was a strength coach in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he caught the ear of the LSU staff at the time in 1958. And they noticed that a couple of their recruits who were local were just faster than everybody, you know, hit harder, were just, you know, coming back from it. They were less likely to get injured. And it was all because they had started doing Olympic lifting with this guy named Alvin Roy, who had been an assistant coach on the 1952 Olympic team, owned a gym in Baton Rouge. So the very first collegiate program that started weightlifting was uh, was this Alvin Roy's program at LSU. He went on, this is a cool picture of him, you know, coaching someone on the beach when he was a San Diego Chargers um, a strength training coach. So, and then the next guy, the guy who kind of even blew it up even more was a guy named Boyd Epley. And he was a strength coach in Nebraska from 1969 to 2006. He's got a pretty famous name. He's got a great book like uh, Nebraska football and Husker power is a really good book just about basics of training. And he was a, he got, he was actually just a pole vaulter on the team in Nebraska. And um, Tom Osborne was one of the coaches. And he, he said, I've noticed that all the guys who work out with you come back to practice healthier and stronger. And I'm interested to know what you're doing in there. And so that was kind of a, you know, that was one of the first things. And Epley uh, started that in about 1969. And in 1979, he founded the NSCA, which is the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And that kind of formalized strength and conditioning and you could see it start spreading, particularly in the college ranks after that, in the early 80s, where you'd start seeing college strength and conditioning programs um, uh, start populating everywhere. So we can go to the next one. So then, you know, there's an evolution of, uh, of strength and conditioning. And I put that on the right side, the BFS set rep log. And um, I remember that being in my high school weight room in the 1990s. And, you know, bigger, faster, stronger was this huge, huge thing. And maybe one of the first ways that uh, strength and conditioning got popular at the high school level. And, but the evolution of strength and conditioning kind of came from just other strong people, if you will, Olympic lifters. Um, Alvin Roy was obviously an Olympic lifter. Boyd Epley had done Olympic lifting. So clean snatches, that kind of stuff got in there. Later on, uh, you know, the powerlifting wasn't even developed as a as a sport or an activity until in the 70s. So powerlifters kind of caught on because they're like, oh, powerlifters are very strong. So you started seeing more squatting, more deadlifting, more bench pressing. That came to the forefront later on, and then certainly bodybuilders that became really big, probably around the the 80s in the mid 80s. That was um, if you ever I don't know how old anybody is, but Nautilus became really big and it was one set to failure, which is a classic bodybuilding thing that we only, you only need to do one set. You do it all the way to failure. And that's all the work your muscles need to do for that day. And you do a bunch of different exercises and you do body part splits. So you train arms one day, you train legs one day, you train calves, you know, whatever. So that became a big thing. And that's actually, you know, hit training, high intensity training is still a thing at some, at some collegiate programs. And then CrossFit is the you know, newer one. And they're all, the, the thing about strength and conditioning is all of those are pieces. None of them are the right methodology to train groups of athletes in high school to, you know, be more resilient and perform better. Pieces of them are all great, right? You should probably do a squat version. I think cleans are really valuable. You got to do some, you know, uh, hypertrophy work where you grow the muscles like a bodybuilder. 
And, you know, the conditioning piece of CrossFit might be semi-valuable to your program as well. So all those pieces, but where, you know, strength and conditioning has gone wrong is if a coach or a group has dove too far into just that specific methodology. Okay, we can go on to the next one. So this is just a quick reminder that all strength and conditioning is influenced by the best college football team. So you could be at the, you know, a small high school in Indiana working with the women's volleyball team, but most of what you're going to see online from people who are talking about strength and conditioning is largely driven by what jo University of Georgia is doing right now or what Alabama is doing or, you know, any number of those things. And that's good and bad. So always keep that as your lens that, you know, this might look like the best thing, but it's also for 21 and, you know, 20 and 21 year old men or, you know, young men. And they're a different type of animal, a different type of person, a different type of being than, you know, um, a 14 year old guy or a 15 year old boy or a 16 year old female. They're all different. So you have to take that into account. So that's just a, a reminder that strength and conditioning is highly influenced by the best college football team. All right, next one. And so, it, yeah, is that a good thing? I don't know. It means we're probably exposed, exposed to good training, but the best football teams also don't have, you know, you don't have the number one division one colleges athletes, right? That's, that's just not going to happen. No high school has that. So we, we always need to keep that uh, in our mind. So next one. So with that in mind, and now talking about, you know, strength and conditioning, and these are things that most of you all know, right? Primary benefits of sound strength and conditioning, we're going to have decreased injury rates. We're going to have increased muscle mass, which is force producing units. You're going to run faster, you jump higher if you have more muscle mass, if all things are being equal. You're going to have improved bone density, metabolic rate, rate of force development. You're going to be more powerful. And I think one thing that is overlooked uh, today is we have a really big epidemic of overly specialized kids where they're basketball players or baseball players at the age of 12. And that's all they do. They play year round sports. We can be a movement multivitamin. We might not be able to fight the fight of don't specialize in sports, which I think is a good fight to fight. Um, but we might not have the horsepower or the manpower to do that. But if, if we have a group of kids that comes in and they are specialized, we can pro uh, provide them with some movement that they wouldn't normally get, right? The overly specialized baseball player uh, gets stronger doing stuff in the other direction or, um, you know, just gets that movement multivitamin. It's a supplement to what they do. So next one, please. So decreased injury rates, this is not like, this is not hard. If you go to Google Scholar, there's just a screenshot of strength training uh, for injury prevention. There's dozens of uh, studies that you can find. They're gonna show that strength training is uh, safe prevention of acute and overuse sports injuries. Um, and you're gonna see great statistics backing that up all the time. Uh, one of my great mentors, um, has said two things that are on this slide. If it's not injury prevention, what is it, right? Is it injury promotion, right? Like, uh, obviously you want to do a, have a strength conditioning program that prevents injuries. And then the other thing that, uh, he has always said, his name is Robert Dos Remedios. Uh, he's a, you know, master strength coach, uh, through the collegiate strength and conditioning coaches association, a high non-contact injury rates are a sign of a program deficiency. If you got 12 pulled hamstrings in your program you're missing something. If you're getting a bunch of ACLs through non-contact, you're missing something in your program. And, you know, that's not to say you're doing a bad job or, or it is a bad program or whatever, but it is a piece of information that you need to start looking at. Hopefully we don't get to 12 or a dozen or whatever, but we can start looking at that. All right. Next one. This is a, this is a, you know, what about injuries in training? The first rule of strength training is don't get anyone hurt. Uh, one of my friends trains NFL people and, you know, his, his big thing is the best ability in the NFL is availability. And so you got to be able to play your sport. So it is absolutely number one that a collegiate or a high school, collegiate NFL, NBA strength coach, they don't get their athletes hurt. Here's just a couple statistics um, where you can kind of look on the right side as an infographic of the Olympics in 2008 and 2012 and the injuries that occurred um, you know, we have snowboard, uh, soccer, all sorts of sports 
Weightlifting is on there as a sport, but that is a sport of weightlifting. But we're going to have really high rates of injury in sport, much lower in actually uh, in in training for the sport. And there's just one as injuries per thousand hours of participation. They don't have just weight training, but they have elite powerlifting. Um, and you know that those are people who are trying to lift as much weight as possible. And we're not going to do that with our athletes necessarily. Those injury rates are are lower than rugby, soccer, squash, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, um, weight training is inherently safe because we're usually using uh, limited planes of motion, uh, planned planned types of motion, all that kind of stuff. So we can go on to the next one. Uh, this, this one's a great one. You know, more muscle mass is good. You're going to see uh, better recruitment um, of muscles. When you lift weights, you're going to have those fast twitch muscle fibers are going to be recruited preferentially. And we're going to have athletes um, who can move faster, run faster. You lift weights, you add more muscle mass, you're going to jump higher, run faster, 10 yard sprint times. Next one. And this is, this is a big one that I think when we're talking about high schools and younger athletes, it sets athletes up for life, right? We're going to have these athletes who are training to train. This is a graphic from Canadian Sport for Life. And what we want to do is destigmatize the weight room, remove the fear around lifting weights, around strength conditioning, so that they're done playing. Most of our athletes are never going to play after high school. And when they're done, they go to their college rec center, they go to their local gym, they're not scared to go lift weights, they're not going to do it poorly, they're going to be able to lift for life and be active for life, reducing chances of obesity and health, uh, poor health outcomes later. And I think that's such a big thing. Let's encourage and get kids and uh, really excited about exercise and lifting and strength training. Next one. Okay, so here's some current best practices going into the next slide. What we want to do is we want to test and assess. The best programs always test. Without testing, you're not going to know what to do. So you should do some sort of movement assessment, whether it's an FMS or SFMA, something you develop on your own. Um, you know, really big topic now is do you need force plates, jump mats, vertex, sprint timers, um, you know, something to test those things and get concrete uh, measurements. I think lift testing is important. We rarely do it to a one rep max. We usually use a three rep max because if the first doesn't look great, we can call the set uh, or they can get to three and we can project out to a one. I think what must test things you need to do in your program, test a 10 to 20 yard sprint. If you can get a set of sprint gates that are, you know, uh, I think there's some out there for three or $400, set it up in a hallway in the school or on a track and test 10 to 20 yard sprint times. Broad jump, you don't need a jump mat. You don't need a vertex. It's a great measure of power. You just need to be able to mark it. Uh, test on strength. I always test pull-ups, and I love the hang power clean. So those are my must tests. 10 to 20-yard sprint, broad jump, pull-ups, and hang power clean. Next one. We train movements over muscles. Bodybuilding as a foundation of training doesn't fill the needs of athletes. So, you know, we athletes move holistically. They move their whole bodies through space, and they need to be – uh, they coordinate different muscle groups to move. They don't move just back and biceps. They don't move just quads and calves. So they move their whole body. So we, we think about um, the movements over muscles. And so if we go into the next slide, you'll see some of my movement categories. And so we create a movement menu based on those categories. And you can name them different things. I think it's pretty standard that you would see a squat and hit, squat, hinge, push, pull. Way I think about that is squat is front side on the lower body, hinge is backside on the lower body, push is front side on the upper upper body, pull is backside on the upper body. We do explosive as a type of movement because we want our athletes to move quickly, a trunk slash rotation kind of thing. So we're having athletes move through multiple planes. Um, I keep single leg in there because so much of sport happens on a single leg. We need to be balanced. We need to be strong on a single leg. And then gait. So in a, any good strength and conditioning program, you want to have some type of gait where they're skipping, pulling, sprinting, pulling sleds, sprinting. Uh, and then once I have that, those categories across the top, I would fill out a movement menu. And this is a real quick one. I did this slide in three minutes, right? But, you, you know, you could go seven, six, seven exercises deep. Uh, and, you know, they could be a progression where it's level one, level two, level three, level four. Next one. Uh, here's plans with movements. If you have your athletes two days, we do a push and a pull day. You can see examples of the 
the order of exercise below that. Uh, a three day would be a push, a pull and a total. So we'd kind of on the total day, we'd emphasize some of the stuff we didn't emphasize earlier in the week. So maybe more single leg or vertical push, vertical pull type stuff. And then on a four day program, we would do push, pull, push, pull type thing. Uh, just repeating the days and kind of changing the horizontal and vertical plan. So we want to create a plan with a with the movements. We don't want to just throw things together. One one slide that didn't make it in there because it was just one statement <laughs> was don't create workouts of the day. Workouts of the day are not part of an encompassing plan that moves your athletes from point A to point B. Next one. Um, this is a, a kind of a thought as beginner and intermediate athletes are like full tube of toothpaste. You can squeeze anywhere and get toothpaste out. Meaning anything you do to a high school athlete, you tell them to do a hundred pushups. They're probably going to run faster too, because they, any physical stimulus makes them a better athlete. So more elite athletes need really specific stuff. We'll go on to the next one. That'll kind of make more sense. So, you know, train general to specific is the idea. Don't, we don't need to mimic the sport in the weight room. You don't need weighted baseball bats in your weight room. You don't need weighted baseballs in your weight room. You don't need a weighted basketball. Um, you don't need uh, to hold a basketball while you do a box jump. Uh, you just need to create athletes. Let them have those really specific things when they get really, really good. It, you're kind of wasting uh, the good, at the, those really specific exercises on athletes who could get better from anything if you do it in high school. So I think almost all high school athletes just need really good basics and, and, and you're going to train athletes. You're not training basketball players. Next one. So train athletes, not sports. The best programs train their schools to be athletes. There's an all encompassing program for the school. And there's a tiny bit that might look different because pit baseball players use their shoulders more. So they do a little more shoulder care than uh, the basketball team or the football team, but they probably do just the same amount of shoulder care as the volleyball team or the softball team. So uh, we don't want to, we don't want to overdo it when it comes to the specifics is sports specific stuff at the high school level. It's just, um, it, it's not necessary. Um, and, and it's going to make your, your program divided within the high school, the high school, like, well, I'm on the, I'm on the football program. I'm on the basketball program. Nope, this is the such and such central high school program. We're on that program. All right, next one. And so we wanna train with age appropriate tiers. This is gonna be uh, dependent upon the, you know, your situation and where you are. Level one is an intro to training, basic movement patterns, maybe remediate things that you noticed on some sort of movement screen. You're gonna master the basics and the low loads. It's a lot of body weight. It's a lot of light dumbbells with slow tempos, stuff like that. Level two, you're gonna get stronger in the basics. Your squat, hinge, your push, your pull. Uh, you're working on a back squat or a front squat or a, a lunge or whatever the big one, the big basics in your program are. Level three, you're gonna get stronger in the more advanced lifts hang, clean, snatch, um, that kind of stuff. And then level four is something you, most high school kids don't ever reach. It's You're going to like focus on the speed of the lifts. They already squat 400 pounds. We don't need to squat 450 pounds. So we're going to try and squat 300 pounds really quickly. So we're getting more recruitment of fast twitch muscle fibers. We're using velocity-based training or some more high-tech stuff with that. So we, we want to create tiers and you kind of slot your age groups in that. It might be freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, but it might be the best freshman might hop in at level two because they, you have a great program and they've been training with you since seventh and eighth grade. Next one. Um, and then set up your facility for success. Uh, I think it's station-based. This is a video that didn't transport over very well, but it's Marquette University. And basically they have like little pods where you can move almost all the way across the room uh, with your same group. And it's very efficient, right? Where you could squat here, hang clean here, bench press here, do all your accessories on the portable, uh, you know, power dump block dumbbells that are adjustable. You don't have like big areas of the room. It's just station based. And then there's an assembly line movement. Uh, I encourage people to get equipment for multiple uses. If you have something that has one use and it takes up room in your weight room, it's wasted space. It needs to have 10 uses, 12 uses. And then the most valuable thing in any weight room is the open space. 
this this room had that kind of assembly line feel and then this is at marquette university in their olympic sports weight room and on one side was about 40 yards of turf where they could sprint as 10 15 yards wide they could sprint they could uh, do change of direction they could push sleds they could do any number of things over there so open space is super valuable if you're designing a weight room and then next one so the future of snc uh it's kind of you know is it a yeah we'll just go on to the next slide is um you know coming soon their performance departments you've seen this at college performance departments, they have sports science departments, integrated with medicine, integrated with nutrition and sports psychology. That Marquette one was really interesting. Uh, I'm involved in USA weightlifting. We went up there for a biomechanics camp. So the sports science department of USA weightlifting was there. Uh, they were doing biomechanical analysis, force plates, all that kind of stuff. Had uh, some blood work done with the medicine, uh, nutrition consultations, DEXA scans, and uh, you know some visualization with the sports psychology because all those pieces need to meet together. And at the high school level, you you guys might not have all those things in one spot like a college or professionals would have, but work on finding those people to bring in with you uh, that are you know on the same page when you're talking to your ortho. They know what kind of training you're doing so that they are understanding what's kind of going on and the athletic trainers are, you know, all of you guys working together so that, um, so that you guys have a really integrated approach and the athletes will, uh, will benefit so much out of something like that. Next one. Okay. That's, uh, my get in touch. I tried to run through that pretty quick, but I took too long anyways. Um, uh, that's how to get on Instagram at Will Fleming or willfleming.com are two places to find me. And any questions, if, if we have any time left, Scott, I'm, I'm great to go. Yeah, no, Will, that was uh, awesome. That was a great presentation. Just uh, great information for everybody to hear, uh, especially from your lens. Uh, I know we've talked about some of these things about early sports specialization and, um, you know, needing to develop athletes uh, in general and not just a great baseball player or basketball yeah. player. Uh, and that's so important. Uh, I, I kind of laughed when you talked about efficiency moving through the weight room, mm -hmm. because my problem is I go to the Y and there's a bunch of high school or early college kids sitting on the machines yeah. watching videos on their cell phones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think all of you at the high school level should have rules of zero cell phone use in the zero weight room, um, and that would help your, your uh, strength and conditioning program immensely. Big time. Uh, your your comments about uh, movement screens. Uh, mm -hmm. We just did a webinar on functional movement screens, and I, I think this was a great transition into why that's important in the weight room. Um, can you kind of go over maybe what you do with an athlete that comes into your gym, maybe first time, how do you approach them, um, and how do you talk about goals and setting a plan? Yeah, so for a long time i've been an fms kind of guy i mean I, I know that there are limitations to the fms uh, if you dive in this far or that far but the thing that has been really valuable for me is i've been doing an fms with people for 13 or 14 years so i've seen a lot of them um, mm -hmm. and so that information is just kind of good information for me to get because i can compare it back to years and years and years of them and so a, a first time in is going to have some piece of a movement screen uh, and some element of teaching. And we're going to take, and th that teaching may be just, you know, some of the big things we're going to do. Maybe it's just our warm up that we have this dynamic warm up. We're going to teach you that so we can get that communication and be on the same page. And then we're going to move, you know, I'm going to take that information and turn it into a piece of the, uh, of the puzzle for your goals. Like you're um, 14, you play baseball and do and basketball. And, you know, you kind of, you, you seem to have, uh, a pretty poor overhead squat. I'm going to know what not to have have in the program. Uh, I'm going to have years and years of athletes who have done similar stuff and places to start from there. So then the next time we're going to come in, we're more teaching, more teaching. And I say early on when you get someone in the weight room, it's all teaching. There's not sets and reps. It's a chunk of time on this skill and then this skill and then this skill. Yeah. I, like during your presentation, I loved your the quote of movement multivitamin. Yeah. So good. Right. Uh, yeah. And I think what 
a lot of athletes get bogged down in is a very specific movement pattern in their sport. For example, I'm a golfer. I love to golf. And so what do you spend most of your time doing? You spend most of your time in a certain position with one direction of rotation, yep. right? And so it's how do you balance that athlete for long-term success to avoid injury um, and to just give them, uh, set them up for their life, right? I think that I think that's the movement multivitamin is such a great idea in in that uh, chicken's good for you, right? But if you just eat chicken, you're going to have some deficiencies. And so if you just play golf, you're going to have some deficiencies. So swing the other direction or swing something that rotate the other direction with something else, um, you know, move in a sagittal plane with some power or hip flexion and all that kind of stuff so that you have uh, new new pieces to the puzzle so that you just supplement that diet. So that's why, yeah, the, that's why the multivitamin idea is, is always stuck in my mind. And that's one of the things that we have to fill for our athletes. So that's why if you have a program and you turn it very specific, this is your baseball strength conditioning program, it's just doing more of the same thing. If, you know, in basketball, if you are coaching uh, basketball players, well, basketball players need to jump. Most coaches put too many plyometrics in the program for basketball players. What do basketball players do all practice? They jump. So if you come to the weight room, do they need to jump more? No, you probably need to uh, move with some intention rotationally or uh, slow some things down so that they have some ten like time under tension. So you try and fill the gaps. Hmm, that's great. Well, we got a couple of questions uh, yeah. from the audience. Uh, can you comment on the growth of stretch therapy and businesses associated with that? Uh, college recruiters are very interested in hip and ankle mobility in the position group that I coach, which is offensive line, and it's uh, really become something of interest and focus. Yeah, so I, I don't know specifically about the the businesses that are popping up regarding them. I have a number of years ago kind of associated with a group that had stretch to win, which I think maybe was doing that. And, and it's been fairly effective. I think it's a piece of that, you know, that integrated approach uh, to me has been really, is really valuable that I have good relationships with physical therapists, orthopedic, uh, orthopedic doctors with nutritionists. And so that I can integrate that for the best success of my athletes. One thing that's hard particularly at the high school level is i'm i'm in this group i'm in the high school and then there's these people who are moving parallel to us who run a business and and this relationship can get a little bit um uh acrimonious where they're you know oh, what are they doing over there what are they doing over there and i think the communication and seeing where you guys can mesh and both of you are trying to help the athlete to success is really good so if if you've if you've uh worked with or had athletes work with a stretch therapy clinic, and then those athletes see improved results in areas that make them a better offensive lineman or help them get recruited more, then yeah, go for it and, and create that conversation of how can you guys work in, in some harmonious way to do better for the athletes because that's what that's what we're doing. Yeah, great. Uh, another question, uh, how do you incorporate balance into your training? So, uh, I, you know, trying to keep this limited, a dynamic warm up, huge part of it, right? I think the opens, I said, get open space. If you, if you don't have a lane of rubber or turf, clear some stuff out of a weight room and make space for it. Have your athletes on their feet, probably without their shoes on, have them go through in bare feet, you know, doing a dynamic warm up where they're finishing through their toes on one leg. Um, you know, they're doing a knee hug or a heel to butt kind of pullback, or they're doing a lunge series uh, in bare feet, um, walking slowly, taking their time and, and conscientiously moving. And I think that gets a big piece of that balance uh, kind of functionality. If, if we're talking return from injury, yeah, there's a ton of other stuff we could possibly do. But if we do that, we have the athletes learn what their feet feel like on the ground. Uh, that barefoot warm up is such a huge part of what we do. I have, you know, my Olympic level weightlifters warming up barefoot in the gym every day because, and, and they just have to move in one plane. So I want the, I want 
my athletes who have to move side to side, front to back, all that kind of stuff, they should, they should have good proprioception through their feet by warming up barefoot. And that's one of the easiest ways to do it. It's five, 10 minute warm up, and then you're moving on into your, your workout. Great. That also means you have to keep your gym floors clean. We don't want ringworm breaking oh, out with all yeah, of our athletes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, another question: What what do you suggest for aftercare, uh, after strength training session? Um, you know, are a lot of your athletes using foam rollers, massage guns? Are they doing yoga separately? Um, anything that they're typically building in? Yeah, um, the one non-negotiable and it's typically it's one thing that's semi hard to do depending on your situation is they're in and then training gets done and they're like, see you later. Right. And they just want to, they're going to, I'm going to head out coach. Right. Um, so the one non-negotiable is we do some sort of breath work typically with like feet on a wall, elevated, um, closing their eyes and taking some like diaphragmatic breaths, mm -hmm. try to take the, the nervous system from a sympathetic state where they've just been working out like real hard and they're up here and they probably drank a bunch of caffeine and they're, you know, like this and take them to a calm state because they got to go do something else. And that kind of kickstarts the recovery process. So that's the first thing. It's probably a minute or two minutes where they're lying there doing diaphragmatic breathing into their stomach, turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, go into mm -hmm. the rest and digest. And then they could stretch, they could foam roll, uh, massage gun, whichever is the modality that is the easiest to accomplish, but some sort of recovery modality. I'm, I'm a, I'm big on like be in your situation and do the best with your situation. If you don't have a bunch of room for, you know, stretching and all that kind of stuff, then, you know, there's a little corner with a couple of foam rollers and, and stuff like that, whatever your situation is, just do that thing and be consistent with it. So you can see results. But the number one thing is that breath work for about a minute to two minutes, get into parasympathetic. So they're relaxed and then they go into the next thing. What a great tip. I think we we all could use more parasympathetic, yeah. right? With our busy lives, stressful lives, and uh, we get overly anxious about a lot of things. Kicking that parasympathetic system in uh, with meditation or breath work can be a great, great tool. Um, I had a specific question about early lifting for kids. Mm -hmm. um, what have your experiences been when maybe a parent goes, hey, you know, my nine-year-old uh, is on three different travel teams and I want to start getting getting him stronger uh, to be a good, you know, good football player. What would your response to them be? Well, there's a couple things. One is, you know, the inclination is tell them what they want to hear, but give them what they need kind of idea would be what I'm going to try to start steering them to. Um, but in truth, if you talk about a nine-year-old, uh, one, uh, sometimes their attention spans don't even, it would be a really specific nine-year-old who could ever go to a weight room and do stuff, right? A nine-year-old, you're going to, you need to turn strength training or physical, that kind of stuff into more gameplay. The reason they like, they play three different sports is they like the games. They don't love mm -hmm. the practices, right? Or they like, um, home run derby in practice. They like, you know, they like the parts that feel like games. They don't like the run. They don't want to run poles in, um, in baseball. So, you know, just say, Hey, you're going to do three sets of five on the squat. Cause that's what works for high school kids. That's not going to even work. That's not going to work mentally. It's not going to really work physically. So what I tend to say is we're going to stop if, if they really want it and it's the right kid. And, you know, typically I'm like, I'm okay. If you're 10 to 11 years old, teaching you how to lift weights, we're mm -hmm. going to have a kettlebell and we're going to learn how to squat and we're going to learn how to, um, we're going to learn how to do push-ups and pull-ups and, you know, maybe it's just dead hangs and all that kind of stuff. I'd like to incorporate into stuff that feels fun where it's a circuit mm -hmm. or you're going to do like a, you know, obstacle course to get there. Yep. But in truth, those nine and 10 year olds, they're not going to get strong because there aren't hormones flying through their body that let them get strong. They're not going to get big and strong, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I just say, Hey, we're going to try and make training fun. So the moment that their body is able to start doing that, and we're going to get them to move well, and I'm going to fill in all the gaps that, um, they get, they don't, that they have because they're doing everything else. And, and you know, the, eventually all that, that's a good foundation. And then when it's time that their body says, Hey, you can get strong, we're going to go, go towards it. 
And, yeah. and so when we had our big performance, when I had my big performance gym, if you were under 11, you were in our, what we would call like junior ninjas class. And so there'd be a skill, that skill might be part of the game. You know, it's like skipping. And then we're gonna play tag where you skip. Um, we're gonna work a lot on hand-eye coordination. If it was a squat, it was probably you had to squat down to grab a medicine ball and throw it over something. And then you had to run and jump over a tire or something, you know, cause it was, it was like the game was get the medicine ball to the island because it was a, uh, you know, everything else was lava, yep. right? Yeah. So, so if you're yep. under like eleven, that was what we were trying to do. So yeah, uh, early strength training. I'm I'm all for teaching foundations, getting kids moving well, getting them excited about the gym, being the positive person who makes them pump to go to the gym. But I'm not trying to like get them jacked. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect answer. Um, what, where do you think most injuries occur for the high school athlete that is trying to get strong or thinks they're going to bulk up uh, and they go to the weight room with minimal, uh, you know, oversight, where do you see them having the most problems either with form or lack of a spotter too much weight? What do you typically see? Uh, too much weight ego lifting with boys is going to be huge, right? Um, not to label a whole gender, but boys are going to go out over and try and outlift their buddies. And where that usually to me gets problematic is they're squatting and they get pretty poor technique in a back squat in particular, or they watch that you should stand this way and do this on TikTok, And you know, that that's pretty terrible. Um, you know, so that's what that's backs that's um typically backs and knees where are uncomfortable maybe uh backs are probably the acute injury spot for a high school kid uh doing things poorly but it's usually because of too much weight um and so you know i think that's one of our biggest roles right because the mm -hmm. your best kids in your program or at your high school they're going to want to lift extra they're going to want to go do more so Let's make sure that they know why, not only how to do it well, but why they should do it well, right? Because full range of motion gets more muscles and, and that's going to help you. So you got to keep the weight a little lower because a full range squat will, you know, uh, recruit more muscles than a half range squat with more weight, right? Which is a true yep. thing. Um, so, you, but you tell them how, you show them how, teach them how, and then tell them why, so that when they go out, they're going to know how to do it correctly. And, you know, I, I love it in the private sector when a kid goes off to high school or they go to their high school weight room, or a lot of times now it's the college weight room. Uh, and their coach like, is like, man, they got the best technique here. I not necessarily strongest, but they got the best technique. They know that they can just let them go and they don't have to coach them on the technique. Yeah. Hey, I, I think that's about it for time. Uh, Will, this was a great conversation. Um, I encourage all the attendees to look out for you on Instagram. Uh, Will Fleming, uh, he's a great coach around town and good friend. Uh, please, there are going to be some emails coming out to uh, evaluate the session. You can certainly send follow-up questions. Um, I'd be happy to help uh, answer those for you. So uh, we'll be sending out a new invite for next month's uh, webinar and hope to see you all then. So thank you very much. Thank you.